Hello everyone, it's Professor Rako here. Uh, this lesson we are going to start uh, doing some examples with leases. So what we're going to do, uh, and as I said last uh, video, is that you know the, the hard thing about this chapter is you're dealing with both the lessee and the lessor. You have finance leases, uh, you have operating leases. So there's a lot of things to keep straight, right? So I always just make a mental note that we're dealing with the lessee in this problem. All right now, some books your, your Spiceland book does lessee and lessor together, so you can see the journal tree side by side. That's fine. Uh, I kind of like doing them separate so we can focus on each one independently, uh, but either way is fine. So, uh, we've got this company, Marshall Company Leases From. Okay, so Marshall Corp is going to be the lessee, Universal is the lessor. That's an important first thing to make sure you realize, especially come test time when. Uh, your professor may only be asking for one side, uh, the lessee or the lessor. All right, so we got a five-year lease beginning January 1007. It's non-cancelable. Remember, non-cancelable plus one of those five criteria have to be met. Uh, fair market value is two fifty one ninety two. The rental payment is sixty thousand per year. Notice this is payable annually in advance. Okay, so this means it is an annuity due instead of an ordinary annuity. This is important because you're going to have to change your setting on your calculator uh, to beginning uh, towards where it says BEG on it if you're using one of those uh, BA2 plus calculators, whatever they're called. Uh, and if you're using the tables, you'll want to use the annuity due table. All right. So if you're using the calculator, make sure you look up. You can probably YouTube this as well, how to switch your calculator from ordinary annuity to annuity due. All right. Uh, the, both the incremental and implicit rate is 10%, all right? So we don't have to worry about that rule, whether uh, if we know or do not know the implicit rate, all right? Um, the estimated economic life is five years. All right, so we have a five-year lease, and it's an economic life of five years, all right? So this, is this a capital lease? Yes, because of the 75% rule. All right, because it's uh, remember if the lease term is greater than or equal to 75% of the economic life of the asset, which is five years, so it's 100%. So it definitely, uh, man, it breaks that, or I shouldn't say breaks that, but it, it satisfies that requirement. There's no residual value in this problem. We'll add residual values in in a little bit. All right, so remember it only has to meet one criteria. All right, so remember the criteria: transfer of ownership that's not met, bargain purchase option that's not met. Uh, the economic life test, that is met, the 75% rule. Uh, the fair market value test is we have to compare the lease present value, which we're going to do right here, and to the uh, fair market value of the equipment, which is the 25192. So it still might meet that, but it only has to meet, meet one. But we'll see if it meets that as well. And then we also have the, uh, if it's a specialized item, but you probably won't see that in a problem. So the only one you have to do work on is that fourth rule, uh, the 90% rule. The rest of them, you can pretty much eyeball the problem and see if they're met. All right, so we want to compute the present value of the lease, okay? So remember back on the, fir the first video, we defined that as it's going to be the present value of the lease payments plus the present value of any uh, residual, guaranteed residual value or bargain purchase option, which there's none. We said those would be the future value on our calculator, all right? So therefore, we do not have that in this problem. All right, so my rental payment is 60. Remember, as I've done before in other videos, I always put numbers in as they are a cash flow to me. All right, so we've got uh, a 60,000 payment that we will be making each period. Therefore, that's what uh, I'm going to put that in as a negative. The lease term is five years, and notice the, pa the payments are per year. So each year is one period. Right? It's not like semi-annual interest in the bond problems where we had to, uh, it was two periods per year. And the rate is 10% per period. Right? So if we run that through, we get 25192 as well. Okay, So therefore, this also passes the 90% rule because that is 100% of the fair market value. So that's obviously greater than 90%. All right, so now that we have this, and this is important, all right? So this future value number is the number that we'll need to pay attention to as we go forward because residual values can affect that uh, going forward, guaranteed residual values, bargain purchase options. All right, so that's something we'll need to kind of uh, pay attention to because you have to be able to get this uh, present value number correct because it's what drives the rest of your problem. All right, so in the previous video, we said that we are going to record. Uh, so it's important to kind of look back. I like to define things and then do it, but I did that in the other video. So that first video says, they're going to record the asset and the liability 
at the present value of the minimum lease payments. All right, well, this number right here then is going to be what's used in these journal entries. All right, so we're going to record the asset and the lease. I just put LL, that's lease liability. Uh, you might see it called lease payable in some books. Any of that is fine. All right, so 250192. So once again, it says we're going to record the asset, which we call the right of use asset, and the liability at the present value of the minimum of the lease payments, which we just calculated. All right, so that records the lease. Okay, so right now we have a lease liability of 250192 in our table, all right, which we'll fill in in just a second. All right, but remember, the payments are paid in advance with leases. So that means also on day one, all right, so this journal entry right here is us signing the lease, but then we also cut a check and pay them the first payment of 60000 which goes to reduce the liability. All right, so if you come down here and look at the table, here's the signing of the lease entry, okay, and then here's my first payment. All right, now notice there's a column for interest expense, but remember, interest is a function of time, so that's going to be zero because no time has elapsed, which means every bit of it goes to reduce the liability. So you can see how this journal entry is fitting in right here. We're reducing the liability and then we have a credit to cash because we're paying cash. All right, so our new lease liability carrying back value on the first day still is now down to 19192. All right, so let's look at this table for a second. So uh, thinking back to our effective interest tables, I went ahead and filled the rest of it in because yeah, you guys should not have any issue with this if you've done the other chapters, um, especially the bond chapter and investment chapter. All right, so remember, the payment amount is the same. This payment amount, we kept, that was given to us. Basically, the lessor would have told us that. Interest expense, we're using the 10%. All right, remember, the interest is calculated just like in the prior on the beginning of the period carrying value. All right, so we're going to take this 190, 192 times 10%, and that's going to give me 19,019. And then, the, so of my $60,000 payment at the end of the first year where time has elapsed, so I'm accruing interest. I'm going to have 19000 of it going to interest and the other 40981 going to reduce the principal. All right. This brings my liability down to 149211 10% of that is this 14000 number. And then we just keep going. And at the end of the lease, we can see that the liability is zero because we've uh, made all of our payments. All right. Notice this dates, these dates are all at the beginning of the year. So that's actually the first, this 1111 right here is the first day of the last year. We actually would have it to 123111 and that would be the last day of the least. All right. That's not important in this problem because there's no future value. All right. So now that we have this table, kind of keep these numbers in mind because they're, they're what we're going to use uh, going forward. All right. So if we switch over to the next page, all right, on 123107, we need to accrue interest. All right, so remember, if you go back to the first video, it says we're going to accrue interest using the effective interest method, which is what we did in the table, and we're going to reduce the lease liability. All right, so that would be 19019, 19019. All right, so now make sure you notice here we're not making a payment till the next. This is 123107, so we're actually accruing interest for the year, and then our payment date is the next date. All right. Uh, so interest expense. And we also record. And then remember, it also says back in the first video that we are going to amortize the right of use asset using the straight line method. So take the 250,192, divide it by five years, and we get 50,038. All right. And that would be uh, our two entries done at the end of the year. All right. So. Uh, the balance sheet presentation uh, on that date. So we would have uh, long-term assets of the RUA, and it would be the 250,192 less what we just amortized, 50,038. So that would be on our books at 200,154. Uh, for my current liabilities, I would have a lease liability. Okay, now look, it's the 19,019 that we just accrued plus the 40,981, which is the payment we're going to make the next day. Okay, and notice that makes up the 60,000 that we're about to pay the next day. And then we'll have a long-term liability, which is also the long-term portion of that, which will be, actually, we know that number. It's the number from the table, the balance remaining, 149,211. All right, so notice up here, something that gets a little bit tricky. Notice this credit right here. Notice we didn't do interest payable. 
All right, we do, we increase the lease liability. And then uh, I'm going to skip this next section here. So we do this. Uh, let's see if I can get it. All right, so we increase the liability. So now we have the liability notice is this 60,000, the 19 that we just accrued plus the 40,000 portion that, of the payment that's going to be the next day. And so when we do this journal entry on the next day, notice this is just one day different. Lease liability, cash for 60,000. All right. So now the lease liability comes off, the 60,000 comes off. Uh, so it, this portion right here sometimes confuses the students up here. Instead of doing interest payable, we actually increase the liability and then take it right back out uh, the next day when we're accruing it. All right. The uh, income statement would have income, uh, I'm sorry, interest expense on it and the amortization expense. And that would be for the 19019 and the 50000 All right. So the point of doing, writing this out, that's sorry, that's three, eight. The point of writing this out is that there's a lot of things affected by leases. Okay. So there's a lot of different accounts affected, a lot to keep straight. All right. One thing I want to point out, let's assume, uh, I'm going to draw it up here. If the payment was on, was 1231, not 11 meaning not the next day. So, so instead of accruing interest, we made the full year's payment. We just started making the payments on 1231 instead of one. Well, if that's the case, we'd have interest expense. And this is how uh, I think the Spiceland book does it where your payments are due on 1231. And the Kiso book might as well. I can't remember. All right. We'd have the lease liability and cash. All right. So notice what I'm doing. I'm basically combining this entry right here with this entry down here. All right, so we'd have interest expense, 19019. We wouldn't be accruing that because we're actually paying it on that day. Uh, we would have the 40981 and the payment of cash for 60000 So just be real careful how things are worded. If it says, you know, you start on January 1, but all the payments are made 1231, uh, that doesn't mean it's an ordinary annuity because the payments at the end of the year, it's still a year later, and then we're paying it in advance. Uh, on January 1, and then the future payments are on 1231. So I do that sometimes with on class, and I do it specifically because it's quicker to do this entry right here than it is to do the two separate journal entries on two different days. And so I try to speed things up sometimes come test time for students. So just make sure you're aware of that. All right. So we got a lot going on. That gets us, that gets us through the first full payment at the end of the first full year. All right. So if we... Uh, Scroll down here at the end of the lease. All right, so now, like, if you look back to the table over here, we're to, we would now just keep doing the same entries over and over again using the new numbers from the table. All right, so now we're at the end of the lease, which means we've already made this payment. That's already been made because that's the first day of the last uh, year. And so if we returned it, okay, just gave it back to them, which is what the lease says we're going to do, there would be no journal entry uh, because the RUA and lease liability Oops. Are zero already. Because they would have been zero on January 1st of that date when we made the last payment. Okay. And then the RUA would be zero at the end of the year when we did the final amortization. Okay. So those accounts are both uh, zeroed out. If we bought it for 50, well, those accounts are still zero. So we would just put equipment on the books. It wouldn't be called right of use asset. It would just be equipment because we would own it. We put it on the books for the 50000 and then we would just start, uh, sorry, start depreciating that like a regular asset, all right? So leases, a lot going on. You can see it's a rather lengthy problem. This video took longer than most videos I do. Uh, it's because I really wanted to walk through it. So what we'll do in the next video is we'll switch gears. We'll use this same information. So it's important to watch these in order. We'll use this same information and apply it to the lessor. All right, so make sure you tune in next time. We'll get the lessor side of things, and then we'll switch to operating leases, and then we'll start adding in residual values after that. So a lot going on, a lot to keep straight. So make sure you kind of really tune in, uh, and, you know, really pay close attention to these and use these as a supplement to what you're already getting in class. All right, so I hope this helps. Please subscribe to my channel. It does help me. And, uh, you know, please share this with your friends. Hopefully it will help them as well. All right, take care. I'll see you next time.